Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome all of you to this uh, uh, webinar series uh, by uh, the Indian Academy of Echocardiography. Today's uh, uh, talk uh, is on uh, echo evaluation of a prosthetic valve. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Satish Govind with us. He is the chief uh, of non-invasive cardiology at uh, Narayana Institute of Cardiac Sciences, uh, Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Satish is a well-known uh, uh, face in the field of uh, cardiac imaging. I am sure all of us uh, know him. But it is my privilege to uh, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Satish, who is my uh, teacher and my mentor. And uh, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing him uh, to all of you. Uh, he is a well-known uh, uh, a uh, face in uh, cardiac imaging. He's uh, uh, done his PhD in echocardiography. He is uh, uh, currently the vice president of uh, the Indian Academy of Echocardiography. He uh, has written a lot of uh, chapters in uh, various cardiology books, and uh, he's also uh, been a principal in investigator in a uh, lot of studies. He has a lot of um, uh, publications in his name, uh, both internationally and nationally. And uh, he was uh, the immediate uh, uh, chief uh, editor of the Indian uh, Academy of uh, Journal of Indian Academy of Echocardiography. So uh, I welcome you, sir, and uh, over to you for uh, giving your presentation. Namaskar to all of you. Thank you, Sunil, for the kind uh, introduction. So let's start with the presentation. So when it comes to prosthetic heart valves, uh, it is an area where it is challenging, not just for the novice or even for the regular person, but even for the most experienced uh, uh, sort of echocardiographer or even the cardiologist, it can lead to many challenges and can lead to situations where we cannot really draw a conclusion. So this presentation is about uh, right from the basics to uh, the uh, little more at a complex level. I'd be focusing primarily on the uh, mechanical valve and the bio valve, uh, mainly on mitral as well as aortic. In view of uh, limitation of time, I will not be touching upon the tricuspid or the pulmonary and definitely uh, not on the transcathedral, which is a big uh, chapter in its own way. Now, uh, the uh, valves, as far as mitral and aortic are concerned, one has to be very careful to realize that it is in very close proximity with each other. So when it is a double valve replacement, uh, there is always a chance that uh, both of them may be affected to some extent. Now, let's look at the indications for prosthetic heart valves. So this is where the latest update has come from. So this is from the uh, European, uh, uh, the American College of Cardiology, AHA guidelines, which uh, just came out last year. And uh, there are various uh, uh, causes, various reasons for choosing the prosthetic heart valve. The options are primarily the mechanical and the uh, bioprocesses. And when choosing uh, many uh, parameters, many factors have to be taken into account. And this is all listed in the guidelines, which is available to you all freely. So I'm not going to the details, just to make you aware that it is there. And the various parameters like age, the patient profile, uh, the cooperation, the clinical comorbidity, everything is taken into account before a prosthetic heart valve is inserted. Uh, but what is also important is, especially in today's context, it is important to take the patient into confidence. So every surgeon who puts in the heart valve today uh, talks to the patient and uh, explains to them, and it is a shared decision making. So there are many a times uh, some valves are uh, sort of not uh, acceptable in due to various reasons. So it has to be uh, with the consent of the patient, with the uh, 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 agreement of the patient. So based on this, the valve is inserted. And this again is highlighted very prominently in the ACC guideline. Now let's look at the dynamics of the uh, valve itself. So when you see the native valve, uh, the native valve opens very nicely. It has got a good orifice. The flow is non-turbulent, laminar, very smooth flow. So this is uh, typical of the native valve and nothing can uh, replace it uh, in terms of the prosthetic valve. Moment you bring in the prosthetic valve, so whether it is a bio valve or whether it is a mechanical valve, automatically things change here. So you, there is a smaller orifice, flow is more turbulent. 
So there is this old saying that you replace one disease with another disease. So that is something which always has to be kept in mind, especially uh, people who are new to uh, uh, ECHO and are doing the prosthetic valves. The types of prosthetic heart valves, there are many of them. Uh, in a very simple sort of classification, there are two types. Uh, you have the mechanical and then there is the bioprocesses. The bioprocess itself has got uh, different types. There is the porcine type, the bovine pericardium, the homographs and the autographs. Let's start with the uh, mechanical processes. First is the ball in case. So this is one of the oldest ones and which is uh, still seen in large numbers because it's such a durable valve which has been there for a long time. Uh, uh, this uh, was uh, not uh, uh, being used. Uh, it is not being used since about 2008. That's when the company shut down. Uh, but because it's such a durable valve, you'll still see it in uh, many, many patients. Next, there is the tilting disc. So this is a single leaflet uh, with uh, two orifices. Then you have the bileaflet valve. Then coming to the bio valve, there is the stentless, hardly ever used. Uh, stented valve, which is very commonly used as far as bio valves are concerned. And then you have the others where you have the TAVI, the valve and valve, and uh, uh, many of the homographs, autographs, which I will not focus upon. So my focus is primarily on the ones which are blue colored. Let's look at the mechanical valves. The mechanical valve, the first one being the ball and cage valve. So when one is doing an echo, so this is typically how it is seen in the transthoracic uh, imaging. So this is the four chamber and you have the uh, first image showing where the suture ring is. That is where the arrow is pointing. And then in the second image, you see this long sort of a very prominent uh, protuberance, which is going into the LV cavity. So it is a very easy valve to identify because of its uh, large uh, prominence within the cavity. And then within the, uh, the, the cage is the ball which goes up and down. The actual ball is not really seen. So don't expect to see the actual ball. You just see a movement which is going up and down. So that is the ball itself. When it comes to the flow, the flow is not exactly great. It's in terms of the hemodynamics, as you can see with this picture here. So there is a lot of turbulence here. So it's not really a, that great a design as far as turbulence is concerned. So there is always this... Uh, uh, possibility of thrombogenicity being quite high in these valves. On 3D, this is how it is seen. So this is from the LA side. So the cage is in the LV side, which you don't see here. So you just see the sewing ring and you see the ball, which sort of uh, pops up and down as uh, some sort of an opacity there. Next is the tilting disc valve. The tilting disc typically again has a sewing ring. So within the sewing ring, you see one disc. And this disc moves up and down, and then it has two orifices. So it has a major orifice, and it has a minor orifice, a smaller orifice and a bigger orifice, whichever uh, terminology you want to use. And uh, uh, the uh, flow dynamics slightly better compared to the, uh, uh, the ball and cage. And the, uh, compared to the ball and cage, typically the flow goes in two directions. So you have the smaller uh, flow and then you have the larger flow. So this is how you should be uh, sort of aiming to see when you are uh, visualizing a tilting disc. And on 3D, again, it's not great in terms of how it is seen on 3D. You can see that there are a, a lot of sort of uh, artifacts and reflections, but generally you see the disc over there and you see the large orifice and then the small orifice over there. The tilting disc is uh, apart from the mitral, it is also put in the aortic position. So this is how it is seen in the aortic position. You can see the uh, disc moving briskly back and forth here. And always remember in the aortic position, it's a little difficult to see. So many a times, most of the times you may not be able to see it. So it's very important to know the background uh, of the patient in terms of uh, any surgical information that is available. But when seen, you can see the disc again moving back and forth here. And on the short axis, you'll be able to see the two orifices, the major and the minor orifice. And when you put the color in the short axis, you'll see the color flow coming through the two orifices. And uh, on 3D, uh, you may not be able to see it in most uh, of the patients, but when seen, it does give a great imaging view, as you can see in this uh, particular image. 
Next is the bileaflet valve. The bileaflet valve again has the sewing ring over there. And what is different from the other valves is that it has got three orifices. So it has got two ori big orifices on either side and a smaller orifice in the center. So this is uh, typically uh, three orifices. And this is the valve which is very commonly used. And the common one in terms of commercial names are the St. Jude's and then you have the cover medics and uh, then you have the Sorin valve. But it's the St. Jude sort of, it uh, really rules the market over here. And uh, uh, when you look at the flow dynamics, it's much, much better. That is why the preference for St. Jude's uh, particular brand is, uh, especially the bi-leaflet valve is very high because of its better flow dynamics and then also uh, lesser likelihood of a clot forming. And uh, this again uh, can be in the mitral position. And uh, uh, when seen in the mitral position, you see the uh, 3D great view here. And uh, generally you see a very good views on 3D. So again, uh, on this, the major orifice on either side here, and then you have the smaller orifice. And also remember that when the surgeons are putting, there is something called as an anti-anatomic and then the anatomic position. So generally you see the uh, commissures on this side, you have the anterolateral commissure in the native valve, and then the posteromedial commissure comes in. But when the prosthetic valve is put in, it, they put it in the opposite direction. So you have the uh, hinges facing in this direction in the anteroposterior. That is because they need to pin this uh, posterior leaflet, especially in this era of uh, preserving the uh, PML and the cordae. Uh, they try to avoid the PML cordae coming into the orifice. And this is a good way of uh, keeping them away from the orifices. And that is why you see in many a times uh, the positioning of the valve when you're doing a 2D transthoracic or even a T, you'll see it uh, in one view and you will not be see, able to see it in the other view and it keeps changing from patient to patient. So this is the position, but you should be aware of this, the anatomical and the anti-anatomical and the reason why it is put. Then uh, the bileaflet valve is also put in the aortic position. So aortic position again, when you see these uh, two discs, especially in the short axis, it uh, comes out very nicely and then you get these flows. So you have the major flows and then you have the small thin flow coming from the center. And again, uh, in the long axis, uh, if you are fortunate, if the window is good, uh, then you may be able to see this. Next, let's move on to the uh, uh, bio valves or the tissue valves. So there are three types here. You have the stented type, and then you have the stentless type, and then you have the percutaneous, the transcatheter uh, valve here. So the stentless valves hardly ever put in, so I'm not going to focus on that. Percutaneous, as I told you earlier, it is a separate topic in itself. I'm not going to focus on that. So my main focus will be on the stented valves here. So in a stented valve, whether it is in the aortic position or in the mitral position, again, one has to go through this process of looking at the uh, area where the sewing ring is. So here you have the stent, which uh, houses the leaflets here. So that is why it is called. So you have these two prominent sort of projections on either side, which tells you they're uh, abnormally sort of unusually, there will be a little prominent. So that easily tells you that uh, this is the stent area uh, on either side. And in between these uh, two prominent uh, echo uh, dense areas, you see the leaflets. So these leaflets are almost like native uh, leaflets. Uh, so they are very thin and uh, uh, you, you sort of will be, uh, for many, sometimes you might even mistake it for a normal uh, valve itself. So one has to be careful. And the flow dynamics, uh, especially in the bio valve is uh, much superior. So that is why it is a preferred valve, though it has got its own limitations. Then, uh, this is another view from the T point. So you can see that uh, the leaflets are so sort of uh, uh, natural in terms of uh, native valve. And then you have the, uh, the stent on either side here. And then you get to see the nice smooth flow which is going through the valves. 3D gives you some very good views. You don't have much of artifacts. So you can see it both from the LA side here. You can see the three leaflets. So this is typical of uh, any bio valve. They have three leaflets here. And uh, this is from the LV side where you can see the, uh, the stents and then the, the structure is sort of supported. So uh, 3D can provide you some really good images as far as the bio valves are concerned. Now let's look at implantation. How does the story start as far as implantation is concerned? So it starts with uh, trying to find out what is the size of the valve. 
So when it comes to sizing uh, from the echo point uh, in uh, preoperatively, it is very important for the aortic position. Uh, the uh, the person who's doing the echo has to give a very accurate, uh, uh, sort of as much as possible, an accurate uh, echo sizing of the aortic uh, annulus, because the uh, uh, flexibility for the surgeon is very limited here in terms of uh, a bigger or a smaller valve and they can't do much about it. Uh, if they really want to do something, they have to go in for some major uh, aortic root reconstruction, which is a little complex, takes time, and uh, that changes the surgical plan itself. So it's very important that when we give the sizing of the aortic valve, we should be as accurate and spend a little time and uh, make sure that uh, we come as close as possible uh, to the, the uh, as far as the actual valve size is concerned. But when it comes to the mitral valve, the surgeons are not really that bothered because the, uh, the mitral valve is much bigger and they are able to sort of modify it, sort of, you know, do some uh, uh, sort of adjustments. So we can just give a rough uh, sort of an idea to them, but they generally don't rely on it too much. When you look at the prosthetic valve, this is an example here of a bileaflet. So you have the sewing ring here. And then this is the housing which is seen over there. So you have these leaflets or the occluders or the discs. So there are various terminologies. They mean one the same. Uh, you can use any one of them. And then these are the hinges which are there which sort of hold it. So this engineering is very important to keep the uh, leaflets, the occluders in place here. And when you are doing an echo, you should be having a mental picture of this and see how close you can come to actually visualize and give information or any abnormalities based on this. And once the sizing is done, this is how the uh, leaf, uh, the valve looks like. So the bileaflet, and then uh, you can see that the leaflets face upwards here and then they face downwards. They, they go in the flow of the, in the direction of the blood flow here. So that is how it is done as far as the mitral and the aortic valves are concerned. Next is uh, preparing the patient. So the journey, the, uh, the the story really starts from here. So this is uh, typically, if I have to use today's day, this is the Valentine moment between the uh, patient's heart and the surgical uh, hands. So this is where it has to really sort of take off. So this sort of gives you an idea as to how the surgeon sort of goes about uh, putting the valve here. So here, the, uh, the disease valve to a large extent has been taken out and they are sort of cleaning up the mitral area here, sort of you know, preparing the annulus uh, taking out the tissues and unwanted area, and then sort of generally preparing the area to, uh, to put in the valve. Next is the sizing. So that is the sizer. So they have these various sizes which they have it in hand. So they keep on sort of putting the sizes and based on the ideal size, uh, then they go about uh, uh, selecting the best possible uh, valve. And then uh, next is implanting it. So here you can see that the valve has sort of, uh, has got a very complicated sort of anchoring. So it has got these multiple sutures who have these pledges in place, and then uh, they gradually sort of uh, anchor it down and position it and make sure that uh, uh, it adheres here. So here the calcium is an enemy of the surgeon. So the more calcific it is, more difficult for the surgeon, more difficult for the patient. There's always a chance of a parallel leak or a problem happening. And that is why they might change the position or go for a smaller size valve based on the calcification. So you have to make a mention of the calcification preoperatively, whether it is an aortic or a mitral valve here. So now that the valve is in place, so the next important question is how do we assess it? So that is where we sort of uh, really sort of have to look into uh, our uh, area of expertise here. So this is again from the latest uh, 2020 guidelines here. So these are the various sort of uh, scenarios where uh, echo has to be done. So the first and foremost is with irrespective of what intervention is, it is always good to have an initial post-procedural TT. So there is always this uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, other side where you can do one more after six weeks or even 12 weeks, because many a times uh, when you do it immediately post-operatively, you have to be careful because that is when the patient is still in pain, patient may be anemic. So the gradients can be slightly on the higher side. And if you're going to use this as an index uh, sort of document for later comparisons, this can sort of mislead you. So generally the preferred one is to wait for a little while, 
maybe after a month or two months and then do the echo and then that would be the index document from there onwards that is where you're always going to refer but in a practical sense it's always good to do an echo immediately uh, at the time of uh, discharge so just to have an idea as to how well the uh, uh, the valve is working and in terms of other issues Next is to do an echo whenever there's a change in clinical in a scenario. So, and again, in a bioprosthetic valve, uh, you need not do it immediately. You can do it after uh, five to 10 years. That's when it starts to degenerate. So you have these various scenarios. So you can uh, sort of go through the document to, to see the particular reference or particular information which you're looking for. Then uh, when you look at the various sort of uh, options that are available uh, in, in terms of uh, how uh, what are the modalities you'll be looking into? So typically it is going to start with the, uh, the transthoracic echo. That is where all of us start with. And uh, that is uh, where we sort of, uh, uh, you know, we afford it. So T is not affordable in or not available in many places. So the next is T and then you have the 3D T and then you have the CT. So this is sort of typical of the algorithm where you can have the imaging modalities that are available to you. And uh, uh, in terms of monitoring, in terms of abnormalities, this is where you sort of go about doing it. And in patients with suspected uh, a bioprosthetic thrombosis or even looking at bio, the bio valve. So 3DT is uh, superior and definitely the use of CT uh, is also uh, mentioned. And in an acute scenario uh, where uh, patients come with all sorts of uh, problems, you have the TT, which is uh, the, uh, the mainstay, and then definitely the use of T, fluoroscopy, and then CT is also mentioned. So these are just recommendations from the guidelines. So this is how you would be sort of using these various modalities to look at the prosthetic heart valve. Now, once the, uh, the, the, the decision is made to look at the valve, so the first thing is to look at the, uh, the disc or the, the ball movement. So this is an example of how one can look at the disc. So this is an example of a bileaflet file. I've chosen this uh, T image because the resolution is great. The imaging comes out very nicely here. So just to give you an idea as to how one can look at the angles. So typically you, uh, what one is going to look for is the opening and the closing. So that is the first and foremost approach of uh, any sort of uh, imaging when it comes to uh, looking at prosthetic heart valve. So look at the, uh, the disc, whether it is a, a ball which is going up and down or a tilting disc, or if it's a bileaflet, how well it is opening, how well it is closing. So this is the uh, opening where you can see the three orifices and then it is closed. So it doesn't close flat. It sort of has a V-shaped, broad V-shaped uh, angle here. So you, there are these angles which one has to look into. So now, what are these angles? So you have these angles. So this is a closing angle here. So you can see that the valve is closed. This is a fluoroscopy. So this is the sort of, uh, if you can take this as the baseline here, so it doesn't sit flat. So you have these uh, angles here. So this is the closing angle. So you have to have a closing angle. And then the opening angle. So you have the opening angle, uh, which is uh, primarily looked at the point where it is in between here. If it's a tilting disc, again, the disc angle, uh, which is expected of that particular design. So that is what one would be looking at in fluoroscopy. So whether it is fluoroscopy, whether it is echo, uh, you have to look at the uh, closing angle and then you have to look at the opening angle and also look at individual leaflets. So are they sort of having the full excursion? So from here to here, they have to have a full excursion. So it might be just that one leaflet might be involved and uh, you need to sort of make sure that it is uh, moving correctly or is there a restriction? So that means if it is not coming into this position, if it's somewhere here, that means on echo, there is some restriction of the uh, occluded, the disc over there. So uh, uh, with this information in, uh, in your uh, sort of uh, uh, armamentarium, so in your, uh, uh, which is available to you. So now let's start to actually look at how you are going to assess it. So first and foremost is to look at the clinical background of the patient. So one has to look at the symptoms, signs. So is it a follow-up? Is there any acute symptoms? Are there any murmurs? So th these are the ones which sort of, uh, has to be taken into account when looking at prosthetic heart valves because they can be very complex and these so symptoms and signs helps you to sort of uh, sort of uh, come to some sort of conclusion at the end of the study. Uh, 
And it's, uh, the, it, it is very important for every patient uh, that you have to question or to look into the document to find out when the valve surgery has been done. So depending on this, some pathologies, some scenarios can be uh, uh, finalized. And also the type of file. The, if you have prior information of what type of file, it just makes your job easy. So it makes your understanding and imaging much easier. Size of the valve is important. So smaller the size of the valve, you know that greater the gradient is going to be, especially when you have a 21 size uh, below in the aortic. So it can sort of say that, you know, if it is below that, you can say that it is a small size valve, uh, especially in a sort of an average or a slightly bigger person. When it comes to the mitral, it's about 25. So anything less than 25, it was going to be a little smaller size valve. So these cutoffs sort of tells you that what sort of valve you're seeing. So if it is a large size valve, if it is more than 21, more than 25, you know that uh, the orifice is not uh, uh, much of a problem unless there's a pathology involved in this. So smaller size valves may sort of have an intrinsic sort of high velocity, high gradients, which can be uh, causing the uh, gradients to be measured in that way. The body surface area helps to understand the orifice. So uh, you sort of uh, localize, you sort of uh, make it easier for you to understand what is the orifice for that particular size. So it's important that you take the height weight and uh, index especially the orifice area to the body surface area. And uh, very important to know what is the blood pressure, what is the heart rate, and then the rhythm. So this is important, not just for you while doing the study, but also for future studies. So whatever doc you're documenting has to be sort of compared later on. So it will be useful for you if the patient comes back again in future or to some other person where they will know that uh, with, it was with this scenario, they got uh, whoever had done the echo, had uh, uh, the gradients, the recordings of the color flow was done. And now with a different BP, different heart rate, it might have a different scenario. So it's very important to record the BP, heart rate, and rhythm and uh, uh, mention it in the, uh, uh, the report. Uh, lastly, it is uh, also an absolute must to make an attempt to look at any previous echo findings because you're always going to compare it with your present uh, findings. Next is coming to the 2D itself. So now that uh, the 2D is going to be the beginning, so especially when uh, I'm going to focus on the mechanical valve. So when you start with the 2D, first and foremost information you have to identify is what is the type of valve? Is it a ball and cage or is it a disc single leaflet or is it a bileaflet? Then look at the mobility. Is it moving well, looking at the angles? So is there any restriction? Next, look at the sewing ring movements. Is there any excessive movements? It's a little bit subjective. So typically the literature says that if it was more than 15% uh, movements, which is sort of easier said than done, but any excessive movements has to be recorded. That means that there is some dehiscence. So there is some problem with the uh, sewing ring itself. So this has to be correlated. So this has to be looked into. Next, look at any bright areas. So there's always going to be some bright areas. Again, it is easier said than done, but uh, you have to sort of look at it from multiple angles. And uh, the primary focus is, are these bright areas, are there any calcification which was there earlier, continues to be there, or is it some new thing, which is like a panace? So this is going to be difficult, but definitely you need to sort of be aware of it and look at it from multiple uh, angles. And of course, uh, when they have signs and symptoms uh, to look at uh, any uh, particular uh, type of mass which you're expecting in an acute scenario or in a chronic scenario. So is it mobile? How big is the mass, the size, shape? All these things are to be looked into. So if you go in a methodical way, it makes it easier for you to sort of compile your report. And be aware that because of the artifacts, the LA will not be seen so clearly. So you might miss a, uh, an abnormality here within the left atrium. So if you are suspecting something, it's always good to ask for a T. And uh, always remember that uh, the aortic valve uh, 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 sort of always has going to be challenging. So uh, it is not much uh, uh, sort of um, not much easier compared to the uh, mitral because it's a little more uh, at an oblique angle, much smaller. So it's not an eco-friendly valve. And uh, don't sort of get disappointed if you're not able to sew it. So that is typically how the aortic valve is on 2D. Then 
how to sort of go about doing it, use all views, so it's the standard views, and also make an attempt to go off axis. Try some different views, try some additional uh, views which you have uh, sort of not uh, sort of looking at it in a standardized way. So in an off axis, we will be able to see sometimes uh, you know, an abnormality or even a normal movement also. And again, be aware of artifacts, so especially the reverberations, the shadowings, which can sort of uh, obscure uh, uh, problems. And then optimize the gain. Don't make it too bright. So to avoid uh, uh, sort of missing out on masses, there might be a mass, but if you increase the gain, you might sort of hide the mass or you might actually create a mass. So be careful about making it too bright and also make it, don't make it too uh, less also. You might actually miss a mass. Thrombus can be of uh, low echogenicity. You can actually miss this. And use the zoom and focus as much as possible and freeze the video uh, if you have stored it and go frame by frame to look at any abnormalities and in especially in double valve replacements go valve by valve making it much easier finish the valve for, let's say for example you do the mitral first look at the complete analysis and then go to the aortic don't try to do too many things at the same time you'll get confused and you'll get lost next once you're done with the 2d put on the go to the topper so first put on the color look at the color flow pa pattern look at the way the color flow comes so you'll see that this flame uh, sort of a, a characteristic of a, a flame like appearance of a ball and cage going on either side and then you'll in a tilting disc you'll see one large orifice one small orifice and then in bileaflet you'll have c3 c c3 flows and when whenever you see an excessive turbulence uh, you start to suspect that there may be stenosis, but you have to take into account is there an increase in uh, tachycardia or other reasons also. But excessive turbulence, it sort of alerts you that uh, maybe you should be a little more sort of uh, thorough in how you are going to look in, into the uh, findings. Valvular regurgitation, look at whether it is washing jets or abnormal jets. Uh, try to find out whether it's outside the sewing ring, then it's a parallel leak within the sewing ring, then it is a washing jet. And uh, uh, also, uh, as I told you earlier, uh, just like in 2D, again, for the Doppler, the, because of the artifacts, you might miss out on uh, parallel leaks, which may not be seen here. So clinical examination or patient presentation will give you a clue that uh, the TT is not providing information, then it, that means that you have to go in for uh, T. Next, uh, again, uh, sort of what are the tips for Doppler echo? So use all views, just like 2D. And again, when you're looking at color, it's always good to reduce the 2D so that you're not really interested in the 2D. Uh, so if the, the color comes into prominence, so that gives you sort of more focused approach. And again, be aware of artifacts. Very important that you align the Doppler so that you get to catch the flow and also to get a good sort of recording of the spectral Doppler. Avoid too big a color box. Some, sometimes you know, I've seen people sort of uh, using the entire sort of sector with uh, sector, uh, don't do that. So just sort of optimize it, do an either too big or too small. But uh, whenever you feel that it is uh, not uh, required to be so big, you can always reduce the color box. Next is the spectral Doppler acquisition. This is for the gradients. And again, optimize the gain. So don't over gain it. So the background should be just about seen. So uh, if you, uh, over gain it, then your gradients become slightly higher. Then the bio valves, again, more or less the same approach, the 2D and Doppler. So again, the uh, idea is, is it a stented or stentless? Invariably, it is going to be stented. And as uh, for stented, as I told you earlier, so that is how you'll be looking at it. Look at the mobility of leaflets. Look at any degenerative changes. Degenerative changes are primarily bright spots, uh, any thickening which are there. Uh, normally, you don't see it on a, a, a normal bio valve, but when you start to see it, mention it because these are early changes. So it's sort of a clue that the valve is starting to deteriorate and you sort of follow it up uh, over a period of time to see it is worsening. And also look for any abnormal leaflet masses in terms of calcification, in terms of thrombus. Doppler again, go through the same process, look for any regurgitation, same thing holds good. Here, uh, valvular regurgitation is more likely because of uh, the uh, degenerative changes or sometimes even the leaflet fracture also. Stenosis again is uh, a very commonly sort of uh, expected abnormality. Before ending the study, make sure that you look at the size of the chambers for documentation and correlation, any uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, size of the aorta, especially in when it comes to the aortic uh, processes, 
and make sure that uh, you don't uh, sort of ignore or uh, sort of don't give too much of attention to the otherwise they also have to get equal attention and uh, definitely we all do it but just as uh, a reminder look at the lv and rv function and of course the peer pressure so that would sort of com complete your study and those of you who are doing 3dt so for the mitral uh, it's always uh, good to sort of have the la side uh, which is much more easier and if you are sort of fortunate in some patients, it may be possible. So you can also look at the LV side, depending on how good the acquisition is. So typically, it's a long axis views that sort of make up the acquisition. So this is usually in the mid uh, And uh, But if you see any good view, even in an off axis view, sort of, you know, go for it, just acquire it. And... Uh, um, try to sort of include the aorta and the left atrial epidemia. These are landmarks which sort of tells you, gives you a clue as to if you see an abnormality at what position it is. Use the zoom, use the full volume, and uh, use the color when acquiring it. So these acquisitions sort of makes it complete. And always go for two sets of images in case one set doesn't work, you can always go for another set. And optimize the frame rate, make it as high as possible so that your uh, resolution improves. Aortic, it is the same thing. So include the LV and the aortic side. It can be seen on both the sides here. So uh, relatively sort of better off. But the leaflets are definitely again again going to be a problem here, uh, just like in the 2D. But the sewing ring will be much more prominent, but the leaflets are not going to be so easily seen unless they are pathological. The long axis view will be one view. And then again, in the upper esophageal, you will look at the short axis view. Any off axis again would be helpful. And again, use a zoom, full volume, color acquisitions, two sets of images, optimize the frame rate. Now, the next is how to quantitate. So uh, the quantitation uh, is where the real sort of uh, uh, problem or the challenges are going to be. So again, you, we have to be very clear as to how we are going to quantitate here. You cannot really sort of uh, depend on only on gradients. So you have to make sure that you go through a series of uh, parameters and depending on the abnormality and the ambiguity and the challenges, you can go for more and more parameters uh, uh, to sort of come to a conclusion. So this is the table which I generally use to a large extent it works. Uh, there are multiple valves, so many valves in the market, and each of these valves have their own orifices, have their own normal ranges. So what the AC guidelines, uh, what they sort of the authors did, they took these upper, uh, the lower normals and the upper normals of all the valves, and they clubbed it and gave a broad range. And they gave this uh, table, and uh, this uh, table to a large extent sort of guides us. So... Uh, if, when it comes to the mitral valve, you can look at uh, these are the parameters which you, you should be going through. First is the peak velocity, then you'll be looking at the mean gradient, and then the Doppler velocity index, the effective orifice area, and definitely the pressure of time. So here the mitral valve area does not come into play here. So never give a mitral valve area in a prosthetic valve or even in a uh, mitral valve repair with a ring. So it's always going to be the PHT. So the mitral valve area by PHT works only for the native valve, but not for the prosthetic valve. So that is why you have to mention in your report the pressure of time. So ideally, uh, sort of more or less, most of the times when it is an uncomplicated, straightforward sort of monitoring, or if there's no sort of, you know, it is normal, we just sort of finish with the mean gradient and then look at the pressure of time and uh, the velocity. But when you have additional sort of challenges, when the, uh, uh, when the scenario is not so clear, then start to use these other parameters, look at the Doppler velocity index and keep the effective orifice area. It's not so easy to do it, but uh, definitely can be helpful when you have uh, problems related to it. And then these uh, uh, various sort of ranges in terms of uh, the, uh, when it tells you that when it is normal, when it is abnormal, given in the AC guidelines, so you can always have a table or you can remember it uh, depending on how you sort of approach it. So with examples of how you can look at it. So starting with the acquisition, making sure that you get it right. So a simple acquisition. So uh, optimize the gain, optimize the scale. And then you can also increase the sweep speed. So get just two or three so that you get your trace quite nicely. And then you can choose uh, whichever one is the best one and then go for it. And then again, in atrial fibrillation, as we all know, is going to be difficult. So you have to spend a little time for atrial fibrillation and see which sort of uh, uh, beats sort of uh, are more sort of uh, similar to each other and uh, 
come close with not much of variation in terms of a, a, at least about 10 to 15 per percent. If it comes close to that, then you sort of choose it. Uh, ideally, even in a, a sinus rhythm, the book says that we have to do three, but we, you know, we do it in a single beat, it's quite okay. But when it comes to the atrial fibrillation, at least minimum three beats have to be done so that you take an average and put it. Uh, so that is something which uh, you should be aware of and make sure that it happens. And when you report it, you get the peak velocity. So this goes into your report. What was the peak velocity and uh, what was the mean gradient at the time when you measured it? Next is looking at the pressure of time. Again, a very simple parameter. So just putting at uh, this slope here gives you the pressure of time. So this again should go into your report uh, and this can be a follow. -up. So uh, more than 130, we start to suspect, but definitely more than 200, there is an abnormality. And less than 130, we know that it is sort of, you know, it is going to be normal here. Then uh, the Doppler velocity index, again, sort of fairly easy. So the mitral inflow, and then you go to the IOTIC, the LVOT inflow, outflow here, and uh, take a pulse Doppler here. And uh, this is the VTI of the mitral inflow, and then the VTI of the uh, LVOT outflow, and then you divide this. So the this is the Doppler VTI index. So this is a larger number. So this uh, more than uh, uh, higher the number, more uh, sort of abnormal it is. So that is again, a very simple calculation and it sort of works uh, to a large extent. Then the last one is the, uh, uh, the continuity equation sort of uh, approach where you have to look at the measurement of the uh, LVOT uh, diameter. Don't take the, uh, uh, the valve size or even uh, whatever the company is, um, uh, the, the size of the valve the company had given. So that doesn't work. So just go to the LVOT, just below the valve, measure the LVOT size here. And then this is where you do the sampling of the LVOT and then uh, uh, get a good uh, CWD at the inflow. And then you can so calculate the uh, effective orifice area. So this can be done in situations where you have problems and that will be quite useful. Now, the other one is the aortic valve. So aortic valve, again, it is this sort of uh, typical, uh, same sort of approach where you look at the peak velocity, you look at the mean gradient, the Doppler velocity, they're common to uh, the, the three of them and even the effective orifice area. So the, these four parameters are common to both the valves. So it's fairly easy to remember. So what changes here, here is that instead of pressure of time, you do the acceleration time here. So the uh, sh shorter the acceleration time, better is for the patient. So longer it is, uh, that means that there's an abnormality. So just looking at the profile of the, uh, of the, the spectral Doppler gives you an idea uh, as to whether it is abnormal or not. So when it is an early peaking, you know that it is normal. So this is again, how we can look at the aortic path. So uh, here again, uh, the peak velocity is mentioned here, then you have the mean gradient. And then uh, this goes into the report. And then the acceleration time, again, fairly simple uh, measurement, but more importantly, look at the uh, shape of the uh, flow. So more triangular as was stated earlier, early peaking, so that means it's good. Uh, more it is rounded and the peak is coming to the middle, so not so good. Then this is again uh, the DVI, so uh, fairly simple. So here it is the other way, smaller the DVI, so more abnormal it is. So once it reaches 0.25 and less, that means it is severe uh, uh, obstruction over there to the prosthetic pad. Effective orifice area, just like the uh, continuity equation. So uh, it is the same. So uh, here again, it gives you the, uh, uh, the range of, uh, of less than 0 0.8 tells you that it is quite severe. Now, these high gradients, so this is where the uh, problems are. So how does one look at high gradients? So this is typical, uh, let's uh, go through how one can look at high gradients in a post AVR. So if it is obstruction, it is uh, it could be thrombus, it could be panus, and if it's a, a bioval, is there degeneration? And if there is uh, another mechanical obstruction form home for vegetation. Now in terms of functional, so is there any regurgitation? It could be a regurgitation or paravalvular leak, or it could be a valvular leak due to a thrombus, which is uh, sort of uh, uh, not uh, allowing the disc to be seated properly. Or is it due to high flow? Due to various reasons, you can have a high flow uh, situation. 
or pressure recovery. Pressure recovery is something which is very sort of, you know, you run out of ideas, you don't know what's happening. That's when we sort of look at pressure recovery. So it has its uh, own challenges. But uh, what are the other things you have to look into? So the uh, patient versus mismatch is something, uh, but this is something which you have to make sure that you don't do errors from your side. And also in terms of AVR, is there any possibility, very uh, unlikely, but uh, again, uh, is there a supra element to it or is there a sub element to it? Is there an LBOT obstruction also in terms of a dynamic obstruction? So these are some things which you have to keep in mind when you get high gradients post AVR. High gradients post MVR, they are again flow related and parallel leaks, regurgitations can cause high gradients and definitely when there's an obstruction in terms of thrombus uh, vegetation. And uh, uh, PANUS also plays a big role. So there's not much of data when it comes to the aortic uh, in terms of uh, the PANUS, but uh, in the Indian scenario where we have a high implantation of mitral valve, the PANUS is underreported. So PANUS is again something which has to be kept in mind, difficult to approach, difficult to identify, but it is something which uh, can be a causative factor for high gradients. Uh, so keep in mind the PANUS itself. Uh, uh, by literature sort of focuses more on the aortic because the Western literature is more on the aortic valve. But as far as the Indian context is concerned, it is just that we haven't uh, got the data and uh, uh, it's just that the mitral valve itself has got a high sort of uh, uh, panis uh, uh, incidence, so be aware of it. Uh, patient person mismatch again, based on the body surface area. So these are the sort of rule out areas when uh, you're looking at it. And then the uh, bileaflet valve, when it is there, the central orifice can sort of lead to higher gradients. So this is more of a design issue. The pressure recovery again, very complicated. Uh, do I know about it? Yes. Do I use this uh, in terms of uh, in valves? Uh, not on uh, a basis. So it is, it is something very difficult. But again, those of you who are interested might uh, want to go, go through this uh, particular uh, publication, which uh, sort of uh, uh, delves into a lot of uh, details. Uh, they have these various ways of looking into. So you have the energy loss coefficient here. Too. So you have these uh, parameters, the effective orifice area, ascending aorta uh, area, and then uh, uh, you would put all these sort of uh, uh, calculations. So you get the valve area, the pressure recovery you can calculate, and then the net gradient also. So it's a little complex. Generally, pressure recovery is a tough one. So it's always like it's the last one when you run out of ideas and don't know what exactly why the high gradients are. That's when you start to look at pressure recovery. But it has to be in the context of a bileaflet valve, more likely to have a pressure recovery phenomenon. And if it's in the aortic position, if it is a small size iota, a 30 or less, then there is a likelihood high gradients when you have ruled out other causes that it could be due to pressure recovery. And the last one is the tricuspid valve. So just a few sort of uh, numbers here. So you have the peak velocity, you have the mean gradient. So again, uh, uh, very limited sort of data, but uh, uh, the mean gradient is what generally works for us. And then looking at the pressure half time, so a little more than 230, more than six millimeters. So that's when you know that uh, there is some obstruction to it. So that's how you look at uh, tricuspid valve. So this is an example of how you can approach a tricuspid valve. So you can see a bio valve there, which is dysfunctional. So just sort of measuring the peak velocity, the mean gradient, and then looking at the pressure of time. So this is how you should report it and put it into your uh, uh, report. Now, some special points uh, you should be aware of. Uh, uh, you have the washing jets. Again, washing jets are uh, intentionally, they have been designed to be there by the uh, vendor, the manufacturer. So this is to avoid any thrombus uh, formation at areas where they feel it is likely to happen. So they are intentional jets. So how do you look at washing jets? So they are less turbulent and uh, they are more laminar. They are short jets and typically very narrow jets. And you get to see them around the sewing ring where they're supposed to see each one of these uh, uh, so the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the valves have their own particular sort of uh, uh, position where the uh, these washing jets appear. So that's when they you get to see it, and then they are low velocity also. So this is how for washing jets uh, can be looked at. 
Now, artifacts. Artifacts can be in terms of uh, shadowing. As you can see here, if there's a small shadow here, it can sort of obscure. It can be much bigger also, so it can be a problem. And then definitely these reverberations, they hide a lot of sort of uh, information here. So when you're suspecting more, as I said earlier, you can always ask for a T and always you can try to look for additional angles. You can, you need not go for a good classical fourth chamber. You can go for a bit off axis and try to avoid the closure of the valve, which causes it and try to see whether you can uh, approach the LA cavity from another uh, off axis area. So that is something which you can try small tricks, which can sort of help you. And uh, same thing can sort of obscure any regurgitation uh, when it comes to color. Then you get to see these uh, small bubbles, these micro bubbles, micro cavitations. So again, uh, uh, this may not be seen in all patients, but now and then you keep seeing it, nothing to be alarmed here. So these are sort of uh, cavitations which happen when the discs close on the uh, seating, the sewing ring, and small sort of gas filled bubbles come. And generally, they're harmless, nothing to be reported, just be aware of it. Uh, it can be both in the mitral as well as in the aortic position. Then in this era of uh, uh, the caudal preservation, the leaflet preservation for better uh, LV function, better LV geometry, and better recovery, you'll see uh, many patients uh, uh, with uh, uh, papillary muscle, very prominent. And sometimes when it is sloppy surgery or maybe because the suture is given way, you'll see them very prominently. Again, you don't have to report it. If you do want it, it it's okay. So just, uh, but uh, uh, nothing to be sort of, again, really concerned about. So you can see that there's a cord which has come off here. And then LV function, uh, you have to be very careful. So one might be very confident of an LV function, which was good uh, pre, but uh, if it has not been assessed in the right way, post-operatively, you can see that the LV function markedly comes down. And this is, uh, uh, you know, now and then we keep seeing this because the patient has not been taken at the right moment. But this again is part and parcel of the prosthetic heart valve, but you should be aware of it. So. Uh, now that uh, we know how we can approach it. So sometimes echo doesn't really give us information uh, what we really need. And that is when we have to look beyond echo. And uh, uh, that is where these additional other imaging modalities sort of helps us to give us incremental information. Fluoroscopy again is a very simple sort of an approach. So this again is a standard sort of protocol in many and almost all hospitals where if an echo uh, is not sort of really providing the right information in terms of leaflet mobility, the fluoro sort of is looked into. So fluoro again, in some uh, valves, especially the chitra valve, the disc may not be seen so clearly, or even in uh, the disc more in particular positions, it may not be seen so clearly. So the fluoro uh, can be sort of helpful, but it is not uh, sort of 100% uh, sort of uh, going to yield the information that we really want. So examples of a tilting disc here, we have a double valve here, and then you have a bileaflet, and this is a ball in cage on fluoro. So stress echo is something which uh, I really don't have much experience, haven't really done it, but it is there in the literature. So this is something which maybe some of you are doing. So this is when you have discordance and symptoms. So an echo has been done. It says hemodynamics are okay, but patient continues to have symptoms. So that means the symptoms are happening on exertion. So to evaluate this, uh, whether there is presence or absence of uh, any obstruction uh, at exertion, or is it PPM? So th this is where the uh, role of stress echo is. So primarily it is exercise stress echo. Dobutamine also has been mentioned. So here, if there is a mean gradient on stress echo in the aortic processes, or if the mean gradient is more than 12 millimeters in mitral process, it indicates fixed obstruction, and that's when you try to correlate. And uh, uh, especially when uh, the same symptoms are reproduced on exercise, uh, that sort of really helps you. And then when you have pulmonary hypertension, that again, again can be supportive. So when it comes to PPM, then we have to index it to the body surface area. So that is where you sort of separate out the PPM from stress echo. CTA complements echo and uh, it plays a sort of a very helpful role. So here again, one can look at the assessment of uh, valves in terms of its motion, especially the valve leaflets. It is, uh, gives you more accurate information. Uh, the size of structures, the distances of structures, orifices, 
valve triangulations in terms of LVOT, uh, especially the aortic valve, very helpful. So useful also to some extent when uh, echo is not sort of able to provide uh, to separate out thrombus, presence of thrombus, separate out the panis, and also helpful to look at the biovalve degeneration, extent of valve dehiscence. Uh, uh, it's not good at uh, vegetations, but it can definitely tell you the involvement that is there, the complications, the problems, the extent of the valve dehiscence. And also it go, it's very good at pseudoneurysms, capturing it, abscesses, mycotic aneurysms. So that's where CT helps. MRI, very limited role with the metallic artifacts, limits its use, though uh, uh, 1.5 or less Tesla can be used uh, it primarily the uh, approach is to look at flows and velocities, the regurgitation, dimensions, the ventricular functions, and especially useful in stental valve uh, also. PET CT in the presence of, uh, of vegetations, it can be very useful. So this again, uh, when you sort of combine it with the Duke's criteria, so the sensitivity goes up very high and almost reaches 100% as per some publications. The specificity also goes out, so, uh, goes up, sorry. And uh, uh, that's where the role of PET and when you combine a PET CT, it can be very helpful. But whether you can monitor these patients and to say that they are responding to treatment or whether any improvement is happening, it's still not proven. It can only tell you uh, the presence of a vegetation. It has its own limitations, so, but, uh, uh, but the role of PET CT is uh, highlighted in literature. So it should be used in your treatment algorithm uh, when it comes to approaching a patient with suspected endocarditis. So the, my last few images were before I sort of wind up. So just go through a series of interesting images, examples. So here, uh, uh, this is where T is helpful. Anything which is very prominent on transthoracic, if there is a thrombus, there's no need to ask for a T. It is only when you see that the disc is sort of not moving and the transthoracic is not helpful and you want to thrombolize and you're not sure uh, before thrombolysis. So this is where T is helpful. Sort of it gets to sort of give you this information about uh, these uh, small areas of thrombus. As you can see that there is some thin sort of layering of thrombus which extends into the uh, adjoining left uh, atrial appendage. So this is less echogenic and uh, this is one way. So there are many ways where the thrombus can be seen. Generally, it is uh, sort of extends into the body of the, uh, the, the left atrium and it sort of extends up to the leaflets also and it is less echogenic, it can be mobile. So that is how you sort of look at it in terms of thrombus. And the thrombus presentation is usually acute and uh, they have uh, uh, you know, compliance issues, the INRs would be sort of uh, out of whack, it will be less. So that's how you sort of correlate and say that this is thrombus. Now, panels, on the other hand, is sort of uh, different. So you have panels, uh, which is very bright. It's not going to move. So you can see that this is a very bright structure here, sort of projecting and generally sort of in the, uh, this is seen in the aortic position. And it's in the in the mitral. It's much more difficult, uh, though you can tend to see the same sort of tissue which can project into the left atrium here. And uh, you sort of rule out other areas, but this bright echogenicity itself is a clue that it is uh, panis. And then uh, when you go through the gradients and the effective orifice area, so this is how you sort of tells you that it is panis. So how do we sort of look at panis? It is more echogenic. It is not mobile generally seen along the sewing ring and in the aortic side it is on the LVOT side and in the mitral it is on the ventricular side uh, though it can be seen on the atrial side also. Uh, leaflet movements generally are spared but if the uh, panis is very extensive uh, which is very obvious then it may sort of affect the leaflet movement but to a large extent the leaflet movements are generally spared takes a much longer time to develop. So the patient's symptoms are not acute. So it is over a period of time. Uh, that is how you correlate. And the INR generally is quite good. And you know that the high gradients and the INR sort of uh, are not sort of relating to each other. And then uh, keep in mind that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so uh, mitral panis is also there. So it is underreported. Be aware of it when you sort of run out of uh, ideas. And then you have these scenarios. You can have a panis and a thrombus. And also panis can get infected and it can have an endocarditis uh, substrate. Uh, it can behave like an endocarditis substrate also. So that is a little difficult to sort of identify, uh, but it is this scenario is also there. And on 3D, if even in an average uh, sort of uh, window, 
uh, many times you will be able to see. So this is typically how the pinus looks like. You can see this broad sort of uh, tissue which sort of goes around it and uh, obscures the uh, ring and then it sort of narrows the orifice. So this is where the high gradients uh, happen. Uh, beyond this, the leaflets continue to move, but the high gradients are because the orifice has narrowed here and the, obviously the cardiac output comes down. Then you have the vegetations, easy to identify. You have a typical patient with uh, acute sort of uh, fever and uh, many other uh, features of endocarditis. And when you see a, a mass like this, which has got a chaotic sort of uh, movement, and then uh, sort of somewhere in the uh, leaflet swing ring area. So that tells you that it is a vegetation. It can cause obstruction also, extensive vegetations. So this is another example uh, of a mass on the uh, uh, prosthetic back. So the uh, next is looking at parallel leak. So if we, I mentioned earlier about washing jets. So now it is about parallel leak. So here, uh, uh, the parallel leaks typically have turbulent flows and you have these uh, sort of long, very eccentric jets. Eccentric jets, moment you see a lot of turbulence, it is almost like a thumb roll that it is and a parallel leak and the next thing is try and sort of confirm it. And uh, parallel leaks have to be outside the sewing ring and that is where you have to sort of go around and look at various sort of views and confirm that it is coming from outside the sewing ring and they have high velocity and they're difficult to quantify. So we sort of uh, generally look at the orifice area and then look at the spread of the jet and have some rough areas so you can look at uh, the regurgitant volume as a quantification area. So here you can see that uh, the uh, parallel leaks are there on both the sides. So we can have a parallel leak on the medial side and the lateral side. So you have to mention that. And uh, in the 3D, you can see that there is a device which is already put in. And on the 3D, the parallel leak uh, is sort of very well seen and localized. You can see the jet here, and you can see the uh, area where it is leaking. So it is coming from outside. Next is the aortic parallel leak. Uh, so this again comes from outside, as you can see here. So the long axis, so you can again have uh, there you had in mitral, a medial, and a lateral leak. Here it is anterior posterior leak. So generally this is how you can sort of describe it. So the anterior leaks are the ones which you're able to see on transthoracic, but if it's a posterior leak, the artifacts may hide it and here T will be helpful. While T will not be helpful for anterior leaks. So this is something which you have to be aware of. Again, the aortic parallel leak comes from outside the sewing ring and uh, this is how it looks like. And on the short axis, you can try and localize it. So where exactly and how many are there? So especially when it is anterior on transthoracic and on posterior on T. So this is an example of aortic uh, parallel leak. Bio-valve stenosis, just like uh, uh, mechanical valve stenosis, the same thing. So looking at gradients here. And regurgitations, again, here valvular regurgitations are quite common, though parallel leak can occur, but it's more of valvular regurgitation. So again, eccentric jets, high turbulent flow, and then you, what you can associate with is the degenerative changes which are there, and you can have a leaflet fracture or tear, and that is the one uh, which causes the parallel regurgitation and also the retraction as the leaflet loses its uh, elasticity, it's, uh, the cooperation is not there and it causes the regurgitation. Then you have these various sort of uh, conduits, the homographs, uh, just there are many of them, it is uh, just beyond the scope of this presentation. So just an example of uh, how we'll see this. So we'll see uh, this in uh, different forms. So there's an example of how it has got infected. Just to tell you that you have these uh, other scenarios also which can be presenting. Then the bioval thrombus is something which you have to be aware. So this is a very gross one, uh, but in uh, bioval, uh, frequently it has been reported that thrombus, uh, microthrombus can be there. So increasing gradients can be due to microthrombi, which are sort of narrowing the orifice, which you may not be able to pick up even on T also. Uh, but when it is big enough, uh, you can see them and 3DT definitely is going to be helpful. And this is really cross, as you can see here, multiple thrombi are seen here. Uh, the, just uh, one last look uh, at another scenario. Uh, this is a mitral valve repair, though technically this is not a prosthetic one, but a lot of mitral valve repairs are there, so you should be able to identify this. So typically mitral valve repairs, there is a ring which is put posteriorly, and then the anterior mitral leaflet is retained, so you'll see a native leaflet. 
and then you'll see a density which is there and that tells you that it is mitral valve repair. So mitral valve repairs typically have problems either with inflows or outflows. So your sort of approach should be what is the gradient uh, higher the gradient, you know that there is some uh, amount of obstruction. And uh, here again, mitral valve area cannot be given. PhD should be given. Uh, another interesting approach has been uh, uh, an area where uh, you have to keep in uh, mind, which has been reported, is that pinus can occur in mitral valve repair with the ring annuloplasty. So high gradients when you're unable to explain it. So the pinus is uh, uh, one cause. And uh, this again has been associated with certain types of rings and T is quite helpful. And when it comes to regurgitant uh, uh, sort of approach, so what is the severity of MR and what is its uh, cause? So here you have see a very eccentric MR. So in this particular patient, the jet was very eccentric and hitting the ring. And this was causing a lot of hemolysis and anemia. So a little bit of a problem here for the patient. And you can see that it is coming from the postromedial commissure. So not a, a sort of a good sort of ending for this patient, unfortunate, uh, but these are the scenarios that can happen with mitral valve repair. So a uh, very interesting case before I sort of wind up. Uh, so this is about a 32 year old male. So a patient with a dextrocardia had an AV canal defect, interpreted IVC, LSVC, had undergone three surgeries, uh, had a mitral valve replacement, uh, the prosthetic mitral valve, a bileaflet valve, uh, again, a developed parallel leak, persistent anemia, high risk patient for sort of a uh, surgery, just not possible, but persistent anemia. So he had to have some sort of an approach and intervention. So uh, this was a patient uh, uh, with the 3D on atrial fibrillation. So remember that even on atrial fibrillation, uh, the 3D sort of uh, works to some extent and you can see these uh, orifices where it is located. This is the aorta here. And also you can see the amount of tissue which is adjoining. So a little bit of thin tissue. So it gives you a lot of these uh, uh, sort of additional information, additional sort of points. And here is the uh, jet which is there and a small jet which is going into the uh, RA also. So this uh, very complex patient and uh, sort of, uh, you know, how uh, uh, T, how the imaging uh, modalities helps in identifying and uh, localizing the abnormalities and how it can also help in intervention. So this was a patient we did yesterday, went on till late evening and uh, uh, this patient had a device put in, and this was through a transapical approach because he also had an ASD and uh, the, it could not be crossed across the septum. So uh, there was a transapical puncture, and you can see the device very faintly here, and uh, you can see that the leak is almost sort of stopped here. And then once the device was put in place and it was successful, then the puncture was also sealed off. You can see this is the a four chamber in, on T and then the device here, which is there. So uh, it, it's, it's all about uh, how uh, from a very simple sort of prost uh, prosthetic heart valve to very complex situations and how imaging modalities and how inter interventions can be done sort of sums up how prosthetic heart valve sort of presents and how it is it can be looked at. So to conclude, uh, the four sort of cornerstones uh, when you are uh, looking at prosthetic heart valves, look at the clinical presentation, look at the echo in the surgical findings, make sure that uh, you sort of uh, look at the 2D findings very closely, uh, supported with Doppler findings. And when it is not helpful or when it is incomplete, you can look at T, look at uh, 3D echo, especially 3D T, look at fluoro and CT. So, uh, this sort of uh, will help you to come to some sort of a conclusion. And on the reporting, whether it's a mechanical or a bio valve, and if it is a mechanical valve, is it ball in case, is it tilting, bileaflet? If it's a bio valve, is it extended uh, or is it percutaneous? And if you once you've identified, is it normal or abnormal in terms of mobility masses? That means that there's some abnormality. You have to mention what is the abnormality. And if there are gradients, uh, uh, what is the gradient? Is it valvular? Is it uh, paravalvular? And uh, uh, make sure that uh, artifacts and flows and variants sort of uh, does not sort of uh, confuse you. And at the end of it, we have to sort of mention whether it is normal or dysfunctional. And only when we are not sure, we say uh, we, we cannot really be conclusive. That's when we look at other uh, imaging modalities. 
So uh, this is how sort of in a very lighthearted way, I'm sort of uh, looking at this in 20, 30 years of uh, how patients will have their heart uh, imaging. Uh, you know, this is how it will look like when heart imaging is done. So uh, this is uh, aortic conduit, and then you have a stent graft in for an aortic aneurysm, prosthetic valve, pacemaker, you have a coronary stent, and you have a particular sort of closure with a duct. So the heart in future, I think, will look more like a mechanical device rather than actual sort of true heart. So it, this is just in lighthearted manner uh, for quite a long time. So try to compile everything. Thank you for your kind attention. Sunil, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that extensive coverage on evaluation of prosthetic valves. Uh, um, uh, I will uh, take up the questions now. There are a few questions which have been uh, put. Um, so first one is, uh, how to assist uh, patient processes mismatch? So do you want to give some particular points uh, to this uh, to the delegates so that uh, they can look at uh, it uh, whenever okay. they're suspecting it? Yeah, keep the patient process mismatch uh, to the end. Make sure that you uh, sort of rule out any obstructive causes. Uh, before you sort of uh, start thinking of PPM. PPM in the present era has come down to a large extent because the sizing of uh, by the surgeons has improved. Uh, point number one is make sure that you rule out uh, other causes of obstruction uh, for high gradients. Second is look at the valve size. So if it is less than 21 and uh, uh, less in, in aortic position, if it is 25 and less in mitral position, then there is a chance of uh, uh, PPM. Second, uh, uh, look at the uh, time when the surgery was done. Look at the gradients uh, which were there at the time when the patient got discharged or uh, sort of you know post uh, surgery uh, the first documentation which was there you'll find that the gradients would have been high even at that time and uh, a small valve and which is continued so that is how you look at ppm and if you want to be very objective definitely you have to look at the effective orifice area so there are some cutoffs which has uh, which is which is mentioned prominently in literature where anything less than 0 0.65 in the aortic when it is indexed to the body surface area, it is going to be PPM. And if it is mitral PPM, if it is less than 1.2, oh, I think it is 1.2 or something like that. If it is less than that, uh, it is going to be PPM. So that is by indexing uh, body surface uh, area. So that is how you can look at PPM. And in PPM, you'll see that the LVH, especially in an aortic process, would not have regressed. So you'll have a very prominent uh, LVH, which is uh, going to be there. So that would be how one can look at PPM. Yes, thank you, sir. So I request you to stop sharing your screen. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, I'll just take up one more question. So how important is uh, pressure half time uh, uh, utilized in uh, evaluating uh, in assessing the prosthetic valves? Uh, could you please repeat? I lost you a little bit. Could you please repeat the question, Sunil? Mm -hmm. Could you please repeat the question, Sunil? Hello. You've uh, stopped your reading, sir. Uh, yeah. The next question is how important is. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, we are not able to see your video. You've uh, hidden your video. Yeah. You can stop sharing your screen. Okay, okay. I think I mistook my. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, next question is How important is pressure half time utilized in assessing the prosthetic vats? Uh, do you want to give one or two points on uh, how important is the pressure yeah. half time? The pressure half time is a parameter that has to be reported in every prosthetic valve and uh, even in mitral valve repair. Uh, uh, not the mitral valve area. So it is in milliseconds. 
So lower the pressure of time, lesser the likelihood of an obstruction. Pressure of time generally indicates that there is some obstruction. So as the pressure of time starts to increase, uh, that means uh, there is some obstruction to the flow that is happening. So it is an indication of uh, the, in an indirect way of looking at the orifice. So PHT, uh, uh, the mitral valve area cannot be derived from PHT for a prosthetic valve. There's no data. So the mitral valve area uh, has been derived from PHT only for native valve. So that is why it is reported as mitral valve by PHT for a native valve, but not for a prosthetic valve. So that is why mitral valve area by PHT is never reported, should not be reported. It is only the pressure of time which should be mentioned as a single sort of a number. And then based on that number, you can sort of have some sort of a, uh, a conclusion or a comment saying that either it is uh, increased normal or borderline. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is on uh, uh, stentless bioprosthetic valve. You had already mentioned that uh, uh, stentless bioprosthetic valve is not used uh, very often. The question uh, if there is a stentless prosthetic valve, how uh, is prosthetic valve from any? Okay. The stentless valves are a uh, uh, little more expensive. Sir? The stentless valves are more expensive and uh, take a longer time. It's a little more complex. So that is why many hospitals in India don't really sort of go for these stentless valves. You see stentless valves more often in the Western countries. Uh, they have a great sort of outcome, uh, but the reason why it is not used in India is what I uh, mentioned in terms of expense, in terms of uh, the, uh, the complexity. But if you do see a stentless valve, uh, definitely it will look like almost like a native valve. And uh, uh, it is going to be a little difficult in terms of how to uh, assist by echo. So the surgical sort of uh, background, surgical details and a surgical scar will help you. And uh, definitely the clinical information that is provided, you have to correlate and that is when you can sort of uh, look at stateless uh, valves. Yes, sir. Um, I think I don't have any other questions, but then I had one question. So uh, while evaluating the aortic valve, uh, the prosthetic aortic valve, do we have any role of uh, using the uh, acceleration time uh, by the ejection time ratio, does it give any uh, uh, indication on the obstruction? Yes, uh, yes, definitely. That is another parameter. It's a little low, down, low on the list, but when you have ambiguity, when you are not sure, uh, despite using all the uh, men parameters which I mentioned, uh, which are not really sort of providing information, the you want to strengthen your conclusion you can definitely use the ratio of the et by et uh, 80 by et and yeah. uh, uh, you can utilize it definitely yeah. more than 0. 0.4 should uh, uh, yeah. indicate uh, obstruction okay so uh, then uh, there's a question on uh, like there are two three questions uh, uh, but i'll just uh, combine everything uh, how to differentiate between thrombus and panis so you already covered this so just uh, for uh, reassessing or reinforcing uh, just give us uh, two to two or three points which will tell us how to differentiate between panis and thrombus so one is first and foremost is the clinical presentation when a patient presents with the thrombus especially with an obstruction it is usually acute so that is uh, one and uh, panis, uh, if uh, the patient generally may not have symptoms, or even if the patient has symptoms, it will be very long standing and it will be over a period of many months. So that would be how panis uh, is going to present. Next is panis doesn't really occur very early in the surgical sort of a setting. So it takes a little bit of time. So generally, a year or more, though literature has mentioned even six months, but it's very rare. But usually, a panis occurs more after a year, while a thrombus can occur any time. And uh, that is the uh, way uh, uh, panis and thrombus present, and that is the oh. scenario. Next is looking at the INR. So 
invariably in a patient with the thrombus, the INRs are uh, going to be less and there's always going to be a history of non-compliance or poor compliance. So that sort of uh, is a, an indication that this is more likely to be a thrombus, while in a panis, uh, it is, we are, we are, the, the, there's no correlation where the INRs will be pretty good, and that's how it is going to be. Next is the actual visualization of the, thro the mass itself. So uh, thrombus mass is usually less echogenic, it will be more like an echogenicity of the surrounding myocardium, and it will have a very soft sort of a, uh, echogenicity, and it will be, uh, in the mitral, it will be extending onto the chamber as well as coming into the valve, and there will be mobility, it will have an irregular sort of appearance, it will be extending to the center of the uh, orifice also, extending along the leaflets and uh, uh, the hinge points and onto the struts. So it can sort of uh, go in different places and it can be quite big. It can pro project quite prominently in, into the LA uh, cavity. While on the other hand, panis uh, appearance is uh, usually along the sewing ring. So it is uh, generally sort of, it is an endothelial growth and it sort of grows around the sewing ring and uh, it uh, can be circular when it is quite extensive or it can be patchy when it has just started or sort of confined itself to some area. And it is not going to be mobile because this is tissue, it is not going to be mobile and it will be very bright. So uh, the, the, this is uh, how the appearance is going to be. And when it comes to leaflets, the thrombus, uh, and the leaflets, generally there's always going to be some sort of a disturbance in terms of leaflet mobility. So they're more likely to be sort of decreased or even a stuck valve. While in a panis, the leaflets are generally spared because the growth is below. And uh, only when it is extensive panis, when it starts to encroach upon to the orifice area, then may, it may start to sort of interview with the disc movement. So generally in a panis, the disc movements are re relatively spared and the thrombus, it is invariably affected. So that's how we can look at uh, thr thrombus and pans. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, there's a question on uh, some red flags to be raised. Huh? Uh, mm -hmm. When do we consider uh, the uh, maximum velocity or gradient, both at mitral and uh, aortic positions? Uh, just a random number, if you can just suggest. Uh, uh, a maximum gradient which should raise a red flag uh, when the echocardiographer is with the patient. Definitely anything for aortic, uh, you can take uh, 35 uh, uh, mean gradient of 35 mmHg. So if it is more than 35, invariably there is going to be some uh, abnormality which needs to be identified. The 20 to 35 is a gray area, so it can uh, be to, it can be normal, it can be sort of intermediate, it can be borderline, it can be due to so many other reasons. Uh, valve uh, itself can sort of uh, uh, the type of valve that has been used uh, can also cause it. So for aortic, I would say around. Uh, 35 mean gradient, more than that red flag, definitely you should start to investigate and then use the other parameters. For mitral, anything more than six and seven, start to investigate. So uh, that would be the cutoff. And uh, uh, the DVI is going to be very helpful. So anything more than 2.5 and uh, anything less than 0 0.25 generally tells you that there is a problem again. So these two sort of easy parameters tells you that uh, you, you are sort of dealing with a significant obstruction or uh, you may sort of uh, need to use additional imaging modalities if it's in the gray area, borderline area. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a question again on uh, uh, pressure of time. Uh, so the delegate is asking, uh, can there be a raised pressure of time due to increased flow and not due to stenosis? You can get a little bit of a raised pressure half time um, when there is a significant severe uh, regurgitation. If it's a bio valve, if there is a, a regurgitation which is valvular, uh, or in a mechanical valve, a pressure half time can increase slightly because of paravalvular regurgitation. But by far, a pressure half time increase is more due to obstruction rather than flow. Uh, but if there is significant uh, 
uh, parallel regurgitation, then your pressure of time raise can be more due to that. But it is uh, any rise in PhD, just again to sort of repeat myself, uh, look at it more in terms of obstruction. We need to look at the hemodynamics also, maybe the heart rate, blood pressure, any uh, role. If that's flow related, it will not affect that much. Okay, sir. Just the gradients will go. So it's important that we don't go only by gradients. So we have to uh, go by the other supportive parameters. So even if the flow increases, the pressure of time is not going to increase that much. And let's say that it is a hyperdynamic or an anemia. So you're still going to rely on the pressure of time. Okay, sir. So there's a uh, some basic question. How to avoid bright shadows near the prosthetic valve in 2D? Uh, so I think... Uh, you've fun. So um, again, okay. as I mentioned in uh, my one of my earlier slides, uh, you can try uh, off-axis views, additional views, change the position of the patient, change the position of your probe. Uh, you know, if it is a long, a person long axis, uh, just sort of move the probe a little bit, tilt it, you know, uh, more superiorly or more inferiorly or, you know, rotate it a little bit. Uh, the, the, those are the ones uh, which you can sort of try. Uh, but if it still doesn't work, then uh, uh, T is the next one. So uh, uh, beyond that, it, uh, no, it has got its limitations. So that's just about it. Okay, sir. 